Get ready to listen, learn, and earn CE hours. This podcast features content from an accredited CE activity provided by Calibri Healthcare. Visit EliteLearning.com slash podcasts for accreditation and disclosure statements and instructions on how you may be able to earn CE credits. This is Dr. Candice Pierce with Elite Learning by Calibri Healthcare, and you are listening to our Elite Learning podcast, where we share the most up-to-date education for healthcare professionals. Welcome to today's episode, where we're going to be exploring the crucial topic of advanced care planning and its vital role in ensuring individuals receive care that's aligned with their values and their preferences, especially near the end of life. We wanted to discuss end of life because it often involves some really complex decisions about treatment options, advanced directives, and the patient's wishes regarding their care. And it really involves navigating ethical principles such as doing good and avoiding harm and fairness and dignity, and really weighing those potential benefits and burdens of various treatment options, where we take into account the patient's quality of life and their personal values and preferences. And then there's, of course, understanding the cultural and the religious beliefs that can really significantly influence preferences and decisions. So as healthcare providers, we should be skilled in facilitating these conversations and really ensuring that decisions are made ethically and in accordance with the patient's wishes. Our guest today is Jane Markley, an expert in the field who has dedicated her career to educating healthcare professionals, patients, and families on the importance of proactively communicating wishes through advanced directives. Jane, thank you for joining me for this discussion. Thank you for having a course on this. This is extremely important for everyone. Absolutely. And this can be a really tough topic to discuss with anyone. So I'm really looking forward to learning from you today. Well, thank you. I'm glad it, I'm glad I'm here. Yes. Can you tell us a little about yourself and your expertise in this area? Well, my, my first experience in this area was when my mother passed me her advanced directive and said, could you be my durable power of attorney for health care? Um, and that was back in the 70s when this was just not really thought about or talked about. Um, it was... Um, it, it gave me the interest in the subject that led to my career in working with uh, advanced directives. Um, I was in the Navy for 27 years, and there you get to do whatever comes up. And so mm -hmm. I um, showed an interest in this and therefore became a, a, an educator in this arena. Um, I went back when I retired. I went on to corporate America, and I did ethics, but not healthcare ethics. And, um, and then my last career or last job was my own business doing advanced care planning um, work, facilitation work, education, mm -hmm. and all um, over the past 13 years. Well, thank you, first of all, for your service in the Navy. So that's huge. Um, well, as someone who is deeply involved in advanced care planning, can you explain why it's really crucial for individuals and families to really engage in this process? Well, unfortunately, in this day and age, people don't talk about this at home very often. Um, mm -hmm. Back in the early 1900s, people talked about it because people died at home. People didn't go to hospitals and it was just something that wasn't really, it isn't now really discussed. Um, so it's important that it be discussed and to become normal. I think mm -hmm. that's the big part of it. It needs to become part of the fabric of the society that talking about what's important to you and what kind of things you want in certain circumstances is discussed. Um, and it can be, and it's easy to be, if something has occurred, either it's a, a movie star who's died and mm -hmm. all of a sudden there's, there's the issue is back in the news, or there's a family member who's ill or friends have gotten ill. And that's when it's important for it to come, come forth and become a regular part of a, a daily life of people. Until it becomes that, it's going to be really hard to get people to talk about it. I, when you were speaking just now and you were talking about kind of the transition of, you know, back before, uh, it was more of an occurrence, but now it's not as much of an occurrence. Have you seen like a reason why I, that transition has happened? 
Oh, absolutely. It's be, it started when we started having hospitals. People went away to die. They didn't mm-hmm. die at home. It wasn't a normal, it was a big deal. Oh, they went to the hospital and they never came back. So <laughs> those types of things are, are what drew us to the point where we just don't talk about it as much. Mm-hmm. Um, being in a military family, um, you know, every time my husband deploys, that this is definitely something that we talk about. But a lot of my friends, you know, who also have families who are not military, this is not a daily or a, uh, they, their husbands don't deploy or spouses don't deploy. And so mm-hmm. it's not really on the forefront. But because that was brought up this last time, we actually sat down and did a whole advanced directive for, you know, if something happens, who's our power of attorney, but if my husband's gone, who's my power of attorney, medical power of attorney, and, and what are some decisions that I want to make? So that's a lot of information to walk through. So how how do you walk through that process for facilitating an advanced directive for individuals and families? Well, usually people come to me and want to know more about it for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's because there's something going on in their family and some kind, it's just because they've heard something about this and know they don't have it. But what I usually do is start by asking the people, what, why are they doing this? What Mm -hmm. is it that drew you to come to me to find out more about how to complete your advanced directive? That tells me a million things about them Mm -hmm. um, and helps me to understand what direction to go because the beauty of an advanced directive is it it hits the needs of autonomy that we talk about in ethical implications is that people are autonomous they it's the individual's right to make decisions for their health care right and if they don't know what they want it's pretty hard for them to articulate it. And many people don't. Many people need to have the time to sit and think about what is important to them. What Mm -hmm. would they want? Mm -hmm. And what kind of basic beliefs and values do they have that would drive their decision making? Because there's an entire process that we go through for facilitating advanced directives. And that process starts with the individual and then begins to pull in other people like their family members, their friends, even Mm -hmm. their next door neighbors, depending on the circumstances that people live on. And then also um, eventually somewhere along the line, depending on how their healthcare is being received, bringing their provider into the mix as well for joining in the conversation. And, and these are really hard conversations to even have you know, between you know me and my spouse, because he, when he's getting ready to deploy again, and this is something on that list that we have to talk about again, it's very hard for me to not be anxious in those conversations. And, and I think it's because it, it makes you realize the mortality, you know, the, mm-hmm. the, the risk. Um, why do you think that we stray so far from these conversations. We change the subject when they come up. We, we don't Absolutely. want to have these discussions. No, we don't want to admit that we're, that death is inevitable for all of us. And it's easy to say, it's hard to get uh, it wrap, your head wrapped around that idea because we all think we're invincible and gonna live forever, especially the younger we are. And that's what's interesting in my practice uh, is that I'm seeing more and more young people who realize that they aren't infallible. And that's really rare because mostly the young, the younger you are, usually the more you think you're going to live forever. Um, but in this day and age with motor vehicle accidents and shootings and knifings and drugs and all the other things that go along with today's environment and society, they see it and they, they get it. And mm. they come to me and say, I need. I don't want to. I don't want to end up like my friend ended up in the ICU for the last six months. Um, hope we hoping that he'd come back to us. Um, I don't want that if something were to happen to me. Right. So they come to me and say, "How do I do this thing? And how do I make sure that everybody understands what I do want?" Absolutely. Now, as healthcare providers, when, when is it appropriate to start these conversations with our patients? I believe it's appropriate to start as soon as they turn 18. 
And it's just, it ought to be part of the fabric of healthcare. In other words, we were able to do at one hospital that I worked with, what happens is when someone comes in, it's a hospital that has clinics in it. So Mm -hmm. when somebody comes in for their clinic appointment, they get the usual, do you smoke? Do you drink? You mm-hmm. know, all the usual questions, what's uh-huh. your height, what's your weight? Yeah. And do you have an advanced directive? Yes. <laughs> and, and the answer is, if the answer is yes, the, qu- the follow on question is, do we have a copy of it? Mm-hmm. And if not, please bring it to us. If right. the answer is no, then we say, well, we have a f- some information to give you that we'd like you mm-hmm. to take home, mm-hmm. review and You don't have to talk about it at this appointment. You came for another reason, but review Mm -hmm. it, make an appointment and come back to talk to our providers about it. Yes. Now that takes a little while and it takes a lot of commitment on the part of the staff to get to the point where everybody's asking those questions. But if it's on the form, you know, people will Mm -hmm. ask what's on the form. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then you, what, what I affectionately say is you wear them down. If they hear this every time they come in for an appointment, it finally dawns on them that this really is kind of important. Mm -hmm. And maybe I better go in and maybe I better read what I was given and maybe I better make an appointment to do something. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's again, part of the fabric of society. Right. And you know, when, when patients come in to the hospital, that's one of the questions that that we ask them is, do you have a di- uh, advanced directive? And right. you know, if they say no, you check the box. If they say yes, you check that box. You ask them the question, can I have a copy of it? Can you have someone bring it to me? Um, but I feel like most of the time when I'm in, and in different hospitals, via military, we worked at a couple of different facilities, but it's like, here's a piece of paper. Uh-huh. You know, I hand them a piece of paper, but I'm handing them a piece of paper in a time where they're being admitted to the hospital, it's, it's scary. They don't know what's happening. And, you know, it kind of gets pushed to the back. Well, it's also um, viewed by some patients as, oh, my gosh, my surgery is worse than I expected. It, yes. They're going to, yeah, I'm going to die. Yes. And that's not how you want somebody to come into the hospital. You want them to come in. And if you've been talking about it, Mm -hmm. in the outside appointments and stuff like that. It it should be fairly easy, you know? You Mm -hmm. know that thing we've been talking about for years? Did you finish it? (laughs) Is it there? Right. So what are some common misconceptions and challenges that you've encountered in this process? Well, the first one is people don't think that they want it. Well, one of them them is they don't think they want to do it because it's going to cost them money. They're used to wills and wills Mm -hmm. costing money. And this is something that anyone can do. Um, And in 46 of the states, all it requires is two witnesses. In the four states, it requires uh, a notary. But other than that, anybody can do one of these documents. You can write it on the back of a piece of paper. Um, You know, I say the back of a napkin, which has been used before. Um, But... (laughs) But, you know, there are so many forms and so many tools out there. It shouldn't have to be done on a piece of paper. It can be done with, with good guidance from a lot of people who've done a lot of work in this arena. Um, so, yeah, it needs to be um, brought to bear at that point in time that they review and do this. So it can be as simple as just calling the doctor up to, sit, to write a do not resuscitate order. Yeah, um, that's the second step. Okay. Um, basically, if an individual needs to sit down and go through the, the process of thinking about what's important to them, mm-hmm. what their va- basic beliefs and values are, then they need to um, learn about what's going on. I mean, what is what are my medical conditions? You know, mm-hmm. how, how, how healthy am I as a human being? Mm-hmm. What is it that might come on the forefront? And those are questions you need to ask your doctor. I mean, you know, if you've got someone with heart disease or diabetes, you know, there are, there are other mitigating circumstances. And it's important to understand that what your trajectory of health may be for your life. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, someone who's um, in their 20s, 30s and 40s is probably not going to want a DNR. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're not at a point where they need a DNR. And if, right. if they are, then then they're going to have known about it. And there's going to be a lot of discussion related to that. But for the basic average human being who's just out there saying, I think I need an advanced directive, mm-hmm. you know, thinking about it, learning about what the pros and cons are of things like CPR. And mm-hmm. we, uh, we in, the, in the field know that there are many more cons than most people think. It's, it's tough. <laughs> uh-huh. TV has not done us any um, no. great service along those lines. Right. And then it's time to start formulating an idea of what it is you want to do. You know, what is it that you want to put down on this piece of paper? Mm-hmm. The paper is not the be all and the end all. The paper is just a guideline. Um, formulating those ideas and then communicating them with your loved ones. Who is it who's going to need to know that? Is it your next door neighbor who is going to be the one who comes in and sees you every morning and, oh, she didn't show up today and, oh, Mm -hmm. she needs help? Mm -hmm. Um, Is it a family member? And and making sure that you're communicating with these folks and getting ideas from them. I always tell people, just because somebody doesn't agree with what you're putting down doesn't mean it's wrong. This is your autonomous you and you have the right to make decisions for your own care. So it needs to be your document, not someone else's document. And then you need to designate somebody to be your durable power of attorney for health care. And that is extremely important for everyone to understand because that individual is the individual who will speak for you when you can no longer speak for yourself. Mm-hmm. And they need to understand. I can't tell you how many bedsides I've been at where I've got beautifully executed paperwork that says this is the living will and this is the this is the durable power of attorney. And I pick up the phone and call and actually get a hold of this person and find out they didn't even know their name was on the document. Oh, gosh. And let me tell you, that just takes ice water to your heart because yeah. they're useless to you. They just don't have any clue. Mm-hmm. Um, so having a durable power of attorney who you've communicated with and who understands your basic beliefs and values, because there's no way anyone can write a living will and a durable power of attorney for healthcare. That advanced directive can anticipate how they're going to need it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Whether it's a motor vehicle accident, whether they have a heart attack on the street, whether they go into a drowning situation, you just don't know. Yeah. what your end point will be or how it will get you will get there. So knowing someone's basic beliefs and values is critical to helping the person who you designate as your durable power of attorney for health care, helping them to make good decisions on your behalf when you can no longer make those decisions that tie into what your belief structure is. Mm-hmm. Because they can't make, they're not supposed to make decisions for your care based on what they want. It's based on what you want. And that's why many times it's not necessarily the best person to have a spouse be your durable power of attorney for health care. Because mm-hmm. the stress they're under at that point in time is, is horrible. And they're, if, if they, many can and many do it very well. Don't get me wrong. It's not that right. it shouldn't happen, but it, it, it isn't the, starting point for everybody. Right. And, and, you know, just, just my, my family's, what we did as an example is it was hard for me to have the discussion with my husband. I know what he wants, but we actually made his brother the executor over that, uh, okay. over those choices. Um, of course he knows that and we communicated and, and, you know, he would work with me, um, but then my husband chose to be the power of attorney for me. Of okay. course, when he's deployed, it would be my dad. And that was a phone call that I had to make to my dad. That was a hard phone call to be like, hey, dad, if something happens. Absolutely. It's you. Absolutely. Um, and that's the problem in this day and age. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody thinks they're, that the elder folk need the Mm-hmm. paperwork and need to have the conversations. And it's it's everybody because there are more and more seniors whose children who are younger than them are having problems. And they they are ones who are less likely to have had that conversation. Right. Now, I've seen where they have healthcare advocates who really help with some of these decisions for advanced directives. Mm. 
Is there, no. it, can you give me some insight into that? And is, is, is there official training or credentials for those who step into these roles? Okay. Let me, let me, let me start by making a clarification statement. Okay. A healthcare advocate and the work I do are mm-hmm. not necessarily synonymous. A healthcare advocate is someone who normally advocates for an individual on all their healthcare issues. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I call myself a healthcare advocate, but with a primary function of advanced care planning. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, you'll find people who do the work that I do call themselves advanced care planning facilitators. As healthcare advocate has multiple meanings. And right. It, it's, it's confusing to those of us who are clinical, let alone the community yes. as a whole. Yes. So advanced care planning facilitators is probably the best term. And most of those people have some training, but they don't have, they, there are programs um, that are out there to provide some training levels, um, facilitation levels, uh, respecting choices is one of them. Um, many hospitals and healthcare facilities have their own training programs. Um, but there's no national board of folks like this um, who who are trained. Most people are in it because they've had a bad experience somewhere in their life, and they don't want to see anybody else go through that horrible experience. Absolutely. So they are out there to try to prevent that from happening. Um, are they being hired? I have not worked in a facility where we had someone who could help with this training, is this becoming a more, um, are more organizations hiring for this role or? It varies. Um, there are some hospitals and healthcare systems that have advanced care planning facilitators within their program and they've hired them. Usually what hospitals will do is hire a f- a lead for advanced care planning within their facility and or their local community. And um, whether that's done or not depends on the culture of the facility mm-hmm. and the beliefs of senior management. If you have someone in senior management who gets it, who understands advanced care planning and why it's so important, not only to the patient and the family, but to the healthcare staff and to the institution. Because if these are done wrong, Mm -hmm. people are today suing, not because someone died, but because we in healthcare kept somebody alive against their wishes. And that is a real surprise to many healthcare providers. They think, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, you know, I got, I kept this patient alive. Why am I being yelled at? Well, mm-hmm. it's because the patient didn't want that treatment that you gave them that kept them alive. And that can be, for an institution, that can be an extremely expensive litigation. Absolutely. So when you have these advocates that are really trying to help you navigate, it's so, some complex healthcare decisions, um, particularly regarding you know end of life. Where you know, does that start? When you're admitted in the hospital, can they do they you know have offices that? I mean, how do you advertise this? How do you bring them in? How do you um, start that conversation? Well, a lot of a lot of facilities will um, uh, you know they have someone in that position and they build they build their their policies and procedures around that person, and usually, unfortunately, around that person's personality. So if they mm-hmm. leave, sometimes it's difficult to replace them. Um, but they work with the ethics committee, um, and they work with um, admissions uh, to identify people who come in who don't have an advanced directive. Um, and again, not the best time to be doing this. No. Um, so many f- hospitals have, what they've done is they've particularly hospitals where they have, they're the one of in the county, Mm -hmm. in the community. Um, They invest in their community by doing outreach and going out into the community with programs on advanced care planning and why it's so important and what 
that is. Uh, lacrosse, of course, is the is the standard for that, having got 98% of its population to have an advanced directive. Mm -hmm. But that was two hospitals working together with committed people who were being paid uh, at the time to do this work. Um, if the institution's not willing to finance somebody to support this, it's going to die on the vine. Absolutely. And, um, it, it just doesn't um, work as effectively as it does if, the fa in fact, the, um, the CEO primarily and those below him get the fact that this is an important piece of the puzzle. I could even see this as something that would be a benefit from, you know, hospitals to their staff, you know. You Absolutely. Um, HR in some areas outside of hospitals um, use this as a benefit for HR benefit. You know, we've got the advanced directive forms here. We really think you need to fill them out. You know, it's going to help you and your family. You know, it's here. And they um, mm -hmm. frequently will build a cadre of staff members in that uh, company who, um, who've done it. And, and that impacts their financial issues related to the insurance. Absolutely. So I know earlier you mentioned uh, working with he uh, ethics, being an ethics advisor. So what ethical principles really help to guide the healthcare professionals and, and family members when they're making these difficult decisions? Well, first you need to remember the autonomy. The individual is responsible for their preferences and their choices. I mean, yes, they definitely need education as to, you know, what's going on with their health care, what their options are. Um, they need the fidelity, too, to be honest with their patients. And that's one of the problems that healthcare has in this day and age is you know, the, the goal is to keep the patient alive. Mm -hmm. um, whether that's the altruistic mode of well, that's what I'm here in healthcare to do, whether it's a financial issue, we got to keep this person alive. You know, there's all sorts of both good and not so good implications there. But um, having uh, someone be honest with the patient to let them know, here are your pros and cons. This is, this is what you're looking at. People think that if so the doc comes in and says, oh, we've got this, this option, we can use this option. Well, this option may be, you know, what's the percentage? Uh, mm -hmm. And what is it going to do to the person along the way to get to the end of that treatment modality? And how much is that going to impact um, the patient. And it, they need to be able to make that choice, whether it's worth it to them to be miserable um, for a period of time. Right. So it's some tough decisions to make. Jane, thank yes. you for shedding so much light on the importance of advanced care planning and some of the key principles involved in facilitating these vital conversations. In this next episode, we're going to go a little deeper on the collaborative aspects of ensuring patients' wishes are honored. And our guest, Jane, is going to share some perspectives on some interdisciplinary teamwork with physicians and social workers and other uh, individuals who can help us with making sure that uh, we remember those cultural and ethical and uh, religious traditions. So you'll Join us for episode two as we continue to demystify the best practices in advanced care planning because, you know, it's, it's been a mystery to me for a little while. I honestly thought that you had to have a lawyer to do advanced care planning. Absolutely not necessary. So that, that's really good to know. So we will see you in episode two. This podcast featured content from an accredited CE activity provided by Calibri Healthcare. Visit EliteLearning.com slash podcasts for accreditation and disclosure statements and instructions on how you may be able to earn CE credits. Take your learning to the next level by subscribing to more podcasts on compelling healthcare topics.